Hey, welcome to our online class. Today we're going to be talking about the table of nuclides or the chart of the nuclides. Um, both of those names are used. Um, I personally prefer the chart of the nuclides, but the site I use calls it the table of nuclides. So, you know, whatever. Uh, I'll go with either. <clears throat> so, what is this thing? So first of all, you can find a lot of different versions of the chart of the nuclides online. Um, you can also get um, PDF versions. In fact, I'll post one on Canvas. But I find the interactive online charts to be the most easy to use. And, and so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Found at this web address. But you can always search for the chart of the nuclides on Google and there's like four or five different places that have some really good ones. And you know, just see what you come up with, play around with the different versions and see which one you like. So what is this thing? So I had you review isotope symbols and you probably noticed whether you watched my video or went back to look at your Gen Chem book that different isotopes have the same number of protons, but they can have different numbers of neutrons, right? And that's going to be really important in some of the analyses we're going to be talking about. And so it's really useful to know what isotopes there are for any given element. So let's look right here. And what you see right here is um, two axes. The number on the y-axis is the number of protons, and the number on the x-axis is the number of neutrons. Now, it's really interesting. When I look at all the chemistry books out there, those axes are flipped, so the neutrons are on the y-axis and the protons are on the x-axis. But physicists do it this way, and because this is the way that every single chart of the nuclides I've seen is printed, um, this is the way we're doing it, okay? So what do these axes mean? So if you look at a periodic table of the elements and you go across, you see the numbers in the top left corner here keep increasing. So one, two, three, four, five, those are the atomic numbers, if you'll remember correctly, the number of protons. So if you go back to the chart of the nuclides here, the numbers on the y-axis represent the atomic number Z they represent the number of protons. So basically moving up the y-axis means you're moving farther and farther along the periodic table. And then the x-axis, remember, is the number of neutrons. So what that means is as you go further and further right on the x-axis, you're basically increasing the mass of your isotope. So I'm just gonna zoom in real fast here. And here's Chemistry Cat, a.k.a. Leia. <laughs> um, so we zoom in, so you can see right here that um, what we have is we have, for example, hydrogen. Hydrogen has uh, atomic number of one. And you can see as we go from left to right in the hydrogen row, we have H1, hydrogen one, which is one proton and zero neutrons. We have H2, deuterium, which is one proton and one neutron. H3, one proton, two neutrons. H4, one proton, three neutrons, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how this works. Now I'm just gonna zoom all the way back out here and let's look at some larger trends. First of all, you'll notice that this graph has this big swath of color running across a diagonal. What does that tell us? That tells us that the number of neutrons that a particular isotope has is usually fairly close to the number of protons it has. Okay, so you don't find something, for example, that has one proton and 140 neutrons, right? Um, you don't find something that has 50 neutrons and 10 protons, right? So there's a very narrow range 
in which isotopes can exist. And that's not all. So over here on the right of the graph, what you can see is you can see this color thing where we range from red, you know, and this is going through the whole spectrum and then it gets to black, so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and then black. And what these colors represent is how stable the isotopes are, okay? Because just because isotopes can exist doesn't mean they're very happy to stick around. So black, where you see it, is something that's completely stable and once it's formed it's going to stay that way pretty much forever um, at normal room temperatures and pressures. Obviously things could be created or destroyed in you know a star or something like that. But then we have all these things which are red, orange, yellow, which are very, very unstable. And so you can see, if you look next to the colors, what you'll see is you'll see a range of times, okay? So the red is 10 to the minus 12 seconds, um, moving all the way up to, you know, 10 to the 14th years, okay? So what these times represent are the half-life of a particular radioactive isotope. Okay, so either something is stable, where it's going to stay that way forever unless it's acted upon by a huge amount of energy, or it's unstable or radioactive, where over time it will fall apart. And the question is, how much time? That's what these colors are supposed to represent. Right, so the darker the color, the more stable it is. And so what you'll see is looking at this chart, there's a band of black that goes all the way up here and ends up just above 80. And so that's, um, you can actually see up in the upper left corner, it says 83 BI 209. So that's bismuth 209 is the element that has the highest atomic number and is still stable. And then near that band of black, we have a whole bunch of dark things. So we have some relatively stable isotopes right next to that, right? And then as you get further and further out from that band of black, which we call the band of stability, um, you get more and more and more unstable, okay? Now there are some exceptions to that general rule. So as I'm gonna slide further up here, um, as we go into the very heavy elements, there's this big patch right here where there's a lot of super unstable elements. We're definitely going to talk about those uh, as we get into radioisotope dating. Um, but then, even further up, we have another patch of, well, it's not really stable elements, but relatively stable elements, right? We have some, some purples in here, so some things that have half-lives of 10 to the 14th years. So let's now start zooming in because what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to look at some of these elements in detail. So I'm going to zoom in and so I'm basically clicking the plus sign in the lower right corner of the graph and let's look at oxygen um, because oxygen isotopes are really handy uh, for looking at processes in the ocean. So here's oxygen. Oxygen, remember, is element eight. Um, and you could see that it has three black isotopes right here in the middle, O16, O17, O18. So that's oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18, which have eight, nine, and 10 neutrons um, by themselves. And then if you look, you'll see that the rest of the oxygen isotopes, everything from O12 to O26, um, other than those three, are relatively unstable. In other words, they don't last longer than, let's see, the most we have is this, um, this layer of green, which I believe is 10 to the second second, so 100 seconds. It's lasting basically a minute. None of these isotopes of oxygen that are unstable last very long. One thing you could do is you can just click on these, this element. So I'm going to click on oxygen 16 and you can see that over here on the right 
all the properties of oxygen 16 um, pop up. And so what have we got? We've got um, its atomic mass, right? And you'll see that we know the atomic masses to a lot more sig figs than they ever put on the periodic tables that you get in class. Okay, and so there's things like binding energy, which I don't know if you talked about that in Gen Chem. Um, we are not going to talk about that in this class, but that's basically the amount that of energy that holds the protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. Um, so there's actually ways that you can calculate that. And then the part that's the most important for us is to look at this abundance. Okay, so here we see the abundance says 99.757 plus or minus 0.016%. What this tells us is that basically 99.8% of the oxygen all around us is going to be oxygen 16, okay? So they know that to a relatively high degree of precision, right? Now I can go over, I can click on the O17, here's oxygen 17, and you can see that oxygen 17 is 0.038% of oxygen isotopes that exist in the world, and then O18 is 0.2%. Okay, so basically, from looking at this table of nuclides, a chart of the nuclides, we see that most of our oxygen is going to be oxygen 16, there's going to be some oxygen 18, and then there's going to be a really, really, really tiny amount of oxygen 17. So now I want to look at something with a higher atomic mass number, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to grab this slider down at the bottom, and I'm going to move it up, and you'll notice that it pretty much follows the band of stability as you do that. So I'm going to go way up here. Let's look at barium. You'll notice that I can also just click on the chart and uh, just kind of slide it around like this if I want. If I, so you'll see that barium has a lot of isotopes. We have everything from barium-114 all the way over here to barium-153. So it's got like 40 isotopes. But how many of those are stable isotopes? Well, as you can see, it has a lot of stable isotopes compared to oxygen, right? It's got barium-130, 132, 134, 135, 136, 137, 138. Let's go through those and let's look at that information. So barium-130 is 0.1%, basically. 132 is about 0.1%. 134 is about 2%. So it looks like these aren't like the, the real big percentages of barium. So let's see where we get to those. 135 is, oh, we're moving up. It's about 6.6%. 136, 7.8%. 137, 11.2%. And then 138 is 71.7%. So most of barium, even though it has all these isotopes, most of barium is going to be the 138 isotope, barium-138. Now the other thing about barium is it has a whole bunch of unstable isotopes as well. And you can see that as we get further out, almost all of these are in the, the light green to medium green range, so it's just a few seconds, right? But in here, closer in, there's some darker isotopes. So here's barium-128, and you'll notice that if we look at this, it, you can see the atomic mass. Um, what you can't see is the abundance, right? Because the thing about radioactive elements is that many of them do not stick around long enough for us to be able to measure them as a percent of the overall abundance of whatever that element is, right? So barium-128, if you look in this box right uh, here, what you see is the half-life is 2.43 days. So this thing can be created, but it only sticks around for a few days, generally speaking. And that's why we don't count in the abundance. Okay, let's look at some of 
the other ones. Okay, here's a 140, which is about the same uh, as a little darker. And here you can see the half-life is, now we're up to 12.8 days. Okay, so now we're actually over a week here. Um, 133. This one has, really interestingly, has two half-lives. Um, and we'll talk about why that is um, later on when we get into radioisotopes. But basically, some of this is going to last for 10.5 years, right? So essentially what we're seeing here is we're seeing that, you know, different isotopes have different half-lives if they're unstable, right? And we can go all the way up here, right? Here's that, that section I was talking about where almost everything is yellow and orange. We'll definitely look at those later. And then you can see, you know, here's, for example, plutonium. 242 has a half-life of 375,000. You see it says KY, that means kilo years, thousand years. What I really need is I need uranium. Okay, so let's look at uranium 238. Uranium 238 has half-life of 4.468 GY, which is giga years, 10 to the ninth years. Um, what I want you to do now is to go onto Canvas, and I want you to look at the exercise that I gave you, which is basically designed to familiarize yourself with a table of nuclides. So you're going to be testing some of the things you may have learned in Gen Chem to see if they're true. And why don't you do that? And then as you do this, you're going to run into questions maybe. And so our Q&A session that's coming up on Thursday is going to be about any questions you come up with and you know if no one has questions we'll have some other exercises where we can play with the chart of the nuclides um, and get more information out of it so that's what we're doing and I'll see you online pretty soon